Okay. Who did Miss Who did you add this morning? I know you wrote somebody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I figured that. Yeah. Yep. I feel like I knew somebody, but I can't think who it is right now. Oh well. Uh, we might not remember, but the Lord does. So. Uh, uh, Miss Dot, do you want to open us in a word of prayer tonight? I'm a thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you and praise you, Father, for another time to come together and to look into your word, Lord, and to learn more about you. Um, Father, we just ask that you would guide us and help us. Father, give us a tender heart. And Father, I just trust that you move in our hearts, Lord, that you lead us and draw us to you, that we have a burden to know you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hand these little little gems out. Uh, actually, they're probably not gems, but maybe they'll help somebody with something. Uh, we are uh -oh. uh, carrying on with our, our study of the different denominations. However you want to conceive of this, I don't know. We'll look at some groups that I wouldn't necessarily call denominations, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and, you know, whatever as we go, but uh, we can stick with denomination, I guess, will work. Um, and so tonight we are starting to look at what I call the granddaddy, uh, Roman Catholicism. We will not finish Catholicism tonight. It may take us two weeks. It may take us three weeks. Um, and in large measure, it's because our disagreement with Catholicism is not necessarily in the places that we expect it to be, and our agreement with Catholicism is not necessarily in the places that we expect it to be. Um, so uh, she asked me if I was going to out her. I'm going to go ahead and do it. JonBenet's family is Catholic. She was raised Catholic. Um, so if I get it wrong, come slap me, and you know we'll deal with it later. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, Catholicism has been, for the majority of history, the dominant uh, form of Christianity. Um, it, it, as I mentioned, I don't know, two weeks ago, whenever we last looked at this, um, when we think of Catholicism, there, it's really like, which one are we thinking of? Um, because the Catholicism, say, that immediately arose after the early church with Constantine and the Roman Empire and that Catholic church was still a lot like the early church. It was, it was different. It, politics had started to play in it a lot more than had been, but it was still close to the early church. By the time you get past Constantine, you get into the medieval era, 
you have an entirely different looking kind of Catholicism that is, that is guided by and sort of motivated by monks in monastic communities. They're scholarly people. Uh, the, the universities, the early universities that are formed are formed as uh, theological centers of education. They're, they're seminaries on steroids. I mean, that's what you went to school for. Um, law was a part of theology. It wasn't separate from theology. Like all of these disciplines arise out of uh, theology, even science. If you go and you look at, at uh, the, the early, I don't want to say scientists because I don't know if they're quite there yet, but the early um, people trying to figure scientific things out, let's put it that way. I'm sure there's a better word than that, but whatever. Uh, they're doing it in the context of the church, and the church is the Catholic church, but that church is not the Catholic church now. Uh, even I mean, this is not the Catholic Church of the Reformation. When Luther comes out in 1517 against the Catholic Church of the Reformation, he's coming out in, against an incredibly corrupt, power-hungry political machine is what he's coming out against. He's, he, the, the fun thing about Luther is Luther never wanted to break with the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. Luther was steeped in that theological tradition that came out of the medieval uh, Catholic perspective and he recognized what it used to be and what it should be and what it had become. And that was where Luther's biggest disagreements really emerged to begin with against Catholicism. Uh, coming out of the Reformation, the, the Roman Catholic Church makes some changes. Um, and so you get like, what, what are we at, version 4 now of the Roman Catholic Church. Those last, one of the things that has relative staying power through all of that is they, they affirm the Latin Vulgate as the inspired word of God. That is not the case anymore. Um, but at the Council of Trent, if memory is correct and then a little fuzzy and I should have written it down, um, the Latin Vulgate was affirmed as the word of God, not the Greek manuscripts, not the Hebrew manuscripts, not the Septuagint, not anything in the original languages. It was the translated Vulgate, which was in Latin which gave rise to, prior to 1962, the Mass was in Latin. You went to Mass, you didn't hear English, the priest did not give a homily in English, uh, the institution of the Eucharist was not given, in, and nothing about it was English, it was all Latin. Um, Vatican II, in 1962, with Pope John XXIII, radically changed the Catholic Church. So what I'm presenting to you tonight, because we want to know what they believe, is post-1962 Catholicism. Now, we can talk about historic Catholicism if you want, um, but maybe we'll set the groundwork with this, and then if you want to go back and do more, we can. Um, all of that to say, many of us were raised, a lot of Protestants are raised with the idea that Roman Catholicism is the great evil of Christianity. It is a cult. It is anything but Christian. Uh, it is the common enemy of everybody else, right? I mean, if there's one thing that has ever united Protestantism, it's a rejection of Catholicism. Until middle of the 20th century, and then we started to see some of that die out, thankfully. Um, but one thing that I want to say at the outset, uh, and you're going to ask me later if it's because you're here that I'm saying this, it's not. Christians are... Uh, Christians. Catholics are first and foremost Christians. They do believe in Jesus. They do believe in his finished work on the cross. They do believe in salvation by way of his blood. They are Christians. Do they do things differently? Yes. Do they have some weird ideas to us? Yes. But we have weird ideas to them. Okay. Um, so, you know, weirdness is not a barometer for correctness or faithfulness. Um, to survey the entire belief system of Catholics would take at least a year, if not more. Um, for people who wish to convert to Catholicism now, there's a series of courses that you go through called RCIA. Um, and RCIA is a year plus of learning Catholic doctrine, Catholic belief, 
what the Eucharist is, how to do the prayers, how to do the, 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 the you know, the, the gestures, that's the word I'm looking for, how to do the gestures, all, all of it, how to practice being a Catholic, and it's over a year. So we're not going to get, like, down in the weeds like that with this. This is 25, 30,000 foot overview. Um, that said, it's still going to take us some time, but... Um, of course, it would decide to stop working after it worked just a minute ago. It is. <laughs> I shook it around too much, and now it's angry. Uh, okay. Well, maybe, but it's not getting... Yeah, well, that's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so... There we go. All right, so where do we agree? I think that's probably the bigger question before we think about where we disagree. Where do we agree? All right. When I say this, I'm thinking in terms of orthodox belief, what is common to Christians everywhere, what is accepted throughout the course of church history. We are in agreement with the Catholics on the Trinity. We are in agreement with the Catholics on the nature of God, on the revelation of God on the person of Jesus, on the saving work of Jesus, on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, that one gets a parenthesis by it because we're maybe not including our charismatic brothers and sisters in that. There are charismatic Catholics, but that's not mainstream. So, uh, The glory and depravity of human beings, what I mean by that is we're made in the image of God and we're also somehow or another corrupted by the fall and by sin. They believe that salvation is initiated by God. They believe in the community of faith. There, what I'm talking about is uh, the communion of the saints. You'll hear that phrase a lot. That's what they're talking about, that we exist in community with those uh, Christians who have died before us, those who are with us now, and those who will be in the future. That there is a community that exists that way. And uh, we are in agreement with them on the living hope that Jesus Christ will return again one day set all to right. So, significant agreement here. I mean, this is, this is enough to make us live happily together. Should be. Should be. There's an old Anglican uh, maxim, if you want to call it that. It's a Thomas Cranmer, the guy that wrote the first Book of Common Prayer. Um, and it goes something to the effect of, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. So, in essential things about the faith, the church needs to be unified, whether you're Anglican, Catholic, Baptist, whatever. In non-essential things, treat each other with kindness. You don't have to agree, because it doesn't make or break it. Uh, and in all things, charity. So, uh, here we come to points of disagreement. Now, that is one slide with four items on it. Unfortunately, those four items are the things that Catholics are most dogmatic about. Divine revelation and interpretation. We'll say, we'll say more about most of these next week, uh, but I want to go ahead and put them out there for you anyway. Um, Catholics hold, and it, Brother Rick and I were just talking about this, Catholics hold a view that the tradition of the church, the established tradition of the church, is equal to the authority of the Bible which means the established interpretation, the traditional interpretation, equal to the Bible. Um, what I will say about that is we don't have it in our statement of faith, but everybody's guilty of that. Uh, our version of it is, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, okay, does the Bible hold up to it? It doesn't matter, it's the way we've always done it. I mean, so that's a reductive version of their view. Theirs is a lot deeper than that, but that is one area of disagreement. Mariology, the, the great divider. Nobody intended Mary to be this controversial, uh, <laughs> but she is. Uh, what do we do with Mary Theotokos, the mother of God? Uh, well, we'll talk about it. The church and its sacraments. Now, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that tonight. And the issue of salvation. Now, wait a minute. I said that we agreed about the saving, uh, saving work of Jesus. We do. I said that we agree that salvation is initiated by God. We do. But how does it happen? That's where the distinction is. 
so I think the best way to get into this, um, I struggled with how to approach Catholicism because it is so big and so old. Um, one thing I will say is if you ever walk into a Roman Catholic church and you see the mass and you don't even have to really do anything but watch, it feels old because it is old. Like it may be in English now, but it's still the mass. And, and that's the way that Catholics have been practicing. Um, and it gets, it has its heritage in the early church, not nearly the same thing anymore, but it does have heritage there. So, uh, I think, though, what I decided, and I hope this makes sense, um, is to focus on two things which weren't listed here uh, that are foundational to how Catholics get to this stuff. And so the first of these is the nature-grace interdependence. So one of the foundational ideas for Roman Catholicism is the, there's no other word for it, the interdependence between nature or creation and grace. So uh, maybe some definitions will be helpful. Nature is whatever has been created. This is in Catholic thinking. Nature is whatever has been created. Don't disagree with that. Grace is God's favor in relation to the world he created. It's unmerited favor. They will also say that. But in terms of what we're thinking about here for them, grace is God's favor in relation to the world he created. Okay, so you're already seeing the language God created, and then he extends grace through what he has created. That, that is the simple version of this nature-grace interdependence. So nature is anything you can imagine that has been created. Anything from the moon, the stars, the sun, to woodpeckers, planets, grass, uh, I don't know, those plastic flowers right there for Catholics would be created by God in their ultimate sense, because they use materials that were created by God. Uh, men and women of all races, so people can be instruments of grace. That's where Mary comes in, but we'll say more later. Uh, Mary herself, the apostles, the saints, water, bread, oil, wine, all of it can be used and is used to dispense God's grace. It's applied through every aspect, some aspects more than others. <laughs> uh, it's, that's, a, that's a good question. But it's not reactionary, though, is what's my question. Uh, if they viewed it reactionary, that would, that would place limitations on it, in my view. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I may be simplifying it, but I kind of view, like, grace is all. Well, so Catholics would say that God, that, that in the act of creation, that was a gracious act. So everything is grace, to, I don't want to use that term. Everything can be a conduit of grace because the creation of it was gracious, if that, if that makes sense. I think it, I mean, I can, I can actually. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. yeah. I can actually get along with that view. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's that far removed from. Mm mm. Mm mm. Um, when you get to sort of that reactionary idea that you're talking about, ironically, is when you get toward Presbyterians and Baptists on an issue like communion, where either for, for most Baptists we'll say it's a memorial and that's it, in, in which case it's not, there's no grace in the picture, right? Or when you get to Presbyterians, and this is the camp I'm in on communion, which say that there is something going on, God is doing something at the table, but what is the question? For Catholics, there's no what. For Catholics, it is, he's giving you grace. So um, it, it, 
I keep coming back to this a lot, but it really kind of depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. And for them, nature is grace, and grace is natural. So um, I think maybe we'll make this make a little more sense in just a second. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. Basically, you know, I mean, I've got lots of Catholic friends. Oh yeah. You know, and, yeah. And, I, all of this, and what they believe and what I believe have never been an issue. Yeah. 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 I think you know it, it's that's a good way to put it. The frame of mind. Another way to say that maybe it's what are your priorities. You know, when you approach belief and you approach faith and you approach the Bible, what do you prioritize? Uh, as Protestants, we're going to prioritize faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, God alone. Um, and there's a fifth one that I can't remember right now. I can tell you I'm a convenient Baptist. Uh, uh, no, Soli Deo, Deo Gloria. Uh, to God be all the glory. Uh, so, I mean, that, that is like the, the, the thing. And so, like, one of the notable differences between a Catholic service and a, and a Protestant service is the Protestant service is built around the preaching of the word. Like that is what our whole worship service leads to. That is the climax is the preacher gets in the pulpit and expounds the word. Catholics, no. It's the mass. It's the Eucharist. Their whole service is built to lead up to and out from the Eucharist. Why is that? It's this. You know, we see the Bible as God. Some Catholics in history have accused Protestants of worshiping the Bible instead of Jesus because we put so much emphasis on the preached word. Uh, so anyway, uh, that was more of a rabbit than it was anything to do with what you said. But, <laughs> but, but we talked about, yeah. you know, God, from, from the beginning, God has said the same thing over and over mm -hmm. So I, we're going to go ahead and look at three of the sacraments. And again, I think this will be helpful. So you've got the sheet here. It has all seven sacraments on it. The three that we're concerned with right now are baptism, the Eucharist, and confirmation. Um, I'll just read these little definitions briefly. The sacrament of regeneration through water and the word. That's, that's as short and sweet as it gets. Uh, Catholics believe in baptismal regeneration, which is to say that there is something in the water that saves you. But they also believe in infant baptism. Um, so you are baptized as an infant in order that you are cleansed of your sin, that you are brought into the church, that you are brought in with Christ. And then it is, up, it is two things. It is the water and it is the faith of the church that keeps you in until confirmation. Now at confirmation, you taking first communion is now you on your own. The church has done their part. They have uh, educated you. They have trained you. They have brought you up in the faith. Your family has done what they were supposed to do so that you have gotten to this point. Now it's on you. Uh, I'm not ready to become Catholic on this point, but I will say Protestant churches would be greatly helped if they would take that kind of interest in educating their children. Because we wouldn't get, we were just talking about this in Brotherhood, you wouldn't get so many people who walk down an aisle not knowing what they're claiming to profess. You just, you just wouldn't. Um, so. Uh, okay. The Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. So those who have been, I, I love their language. Catholics have great language, like it's very magisterial. Uh, those who have been raised to the dignity 
of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation, participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. Now, sidebar, Catholics believe that whenever they take the bread and the wine, they're taking the actual body and the actual blood. Um, so when they say participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice, they literally mean that. You are literally in the sacrifice. Uh, and then confirmation, confirm, uh, <clears throat> sorry, confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace for, quote, by the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are enriched with the special strength of the Holy Spirit. Hence, they are, as true witnesses to Christ, more strictly obliged to spread and defend the faith by word and deed. All right, Chris, what you got? Ten to twelve. Confession of faith type of thing. Do they have? Is there something similar to what we are? So I mean, yeah. you bring a baby in and they're they're bad. Maybe the, the sprinkling or the the right. baptism, whatever. Yeah. Which is, I I guess this is a misconception on my part, but I always thought that was the infant part of that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was more of a dedication mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The salvation of the salvation baby. Salvation of the infant immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and at what age does that happen? Pretty much as soon as you bring them in. Uh, I mean, it, it it's newborn. Uh, you, okay. Three. Three months old. Yeah. So, so they view that as essentially salvation is just bestowed. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we have the age of accountability, so essentially, right. essentially the infants are covered no matter what. Right. The, the two things that, this is why I say we need more than one week on Catholics. Uh, the, the, the two things that Catholics are holding in tension on infant baptism is on the one hand, they, they, they see the church, and I'm going to say more about this in a little bit, but they see the church as continuing the incarnational ministry of Jesus. Like, they will use the language that the church is the second person of Christ. So when they are baptizing infants, they're, one, holding on to Jewish heritage, right, because Jews circumcise their babies. So baptism is taking the place of the circumcision, but it's, in effect, the same thing. Uh, but they're also literally incorporating the child into the body of Christ um, because it is a generational thing. And, I mean, they make good arguments. Presbyterians use a lot of the same arguments, which is like when you go, at, oh, is it Simon the Magician, when he's baptized, his whole family is also baptized, and sort of the language that's used there is because of his belief, his whole family is covered kind of thing? They will appeal to that to say, well, because the family had enough faith to bring the child in, and because of the collected body and the faith of the body, that's what keeps them here. Because the church is the physical man manifestation of Christ. The priest who does the baptism is standing in the person of Christ. So, I mean, they see all of this as very much like Jesus holding the baby in the room kind of thing. Now, they're not saying that the priest becomes Jesus, but, but it, it is a... It's more than symbolic. It's more than, a lot more than symbolic. A lot more than symbolic. Um, confirmation happens around 10 to 12. Yeah, I mean, it is, they would call it uh, catechism, where you go through, I wish I had, well, I wish I had one to bring, but the, the, Catholic, the catechism of the Catholic Church is about that thick. Um, the last one was put out by Pope John Paul II in 1992, and then Pope Francis revised something in 2019, 2020, something like that. Anyway, they learned that, the essentials They're of the, that. right, wisdom. yeah. Through this is, this is what they, I mean, the program of the Catholic Church is indoctrination, and that's a, we think of that as an ugly word, but it's not. It literally means they are being, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, they're, they're, 
their whole worldview, if it's done right, their entire worldview is shaped by Catholic interpretation, Catholic belief, Catholic doctrine, so that when they come to confirmation, I'm going to say it carefully because I don't want to shortchange belief. At the minimum, confirmation is a belief in the church. At best, it's a belief in the Christological work of the church, right? Um, because in Catholicism, the person and work of Jesus is assumed. So it's not when, when they're not evangelizing their children, is the best way I know how to put it. Whereas we might be, like... Um, Oh, thank you for this can of worms. <laughs> no, but, but this is good. Uh, well, and... Not the person. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the the general opinion of Catholics on that would be that they get to exercise their free will after confirmation. Like, if they one, if they go through with confirmation, that's their choice. Uh, their parents don't make the confirmation choice for them. That that's the kid, supposedly. Um, but then, do you continue to practice after confirmation? Uh, that's where the real fruit is for the Catholic. Um, what, what is the view of salvation? That's what I was just fixing to say. Like between one and three on this list. One and three, you're good. Of their salvation. Between infant and confirmation, you're covered. As long as you were baptized, you're good. You're covered. After confirmation, you have it's <laughs> the best way I know how to put this. Salvation is a continual process. You have to be participating in confession. You have to be participating in the Eucharist. It, those two, if nothing else, because you have to continually be feeding on the grace of Christ. If you're not, okay, here comes weird Catholic. If you're not, you can be assured that you're going to purgatory. Maybe not hell, because you were baptized and you did confirmation, but you're going to have to go to purgatory because you're going to have to pay for the fact that you didn't go and participate like you were supposed to. Right. Right. Now, I want to be clear on that. Catholics do not use purgatory as a like threat and hold it over their children's head. They don't hold it over their members' heads. You know, that one ideological distinction between particularly Baptists and Catholics is Baptists like to preach hell. If you're not saved, you're going to bust hell wide open. I mean, I've heard it out of that pulpit several times. You're not going to hear that in a Catholic homily. Because the church exists, again, kicker, the, church, the Catholic church exists for those who are in it. Whereas for Protestants, that's what I meant when I said we're not evangelizing our children. This is a better way to say it. The Catholic church exists for the membership. The, the membership that's already there, which is the true church of Christ. That is how they view themselves. The Protestant church exists for the non-member. We are equipping our people to go in uh, and share that gospel in order to bring others in so that they may be equipped to go back out and do that. That's not to say Catholics aren't mission-minded or, or they don't do evangelism. They do. But the mindset from the beginning is very different. So... Yes, they have the choice to go through with confirmation or not, and then they always have the choice of whether they're participating in Catholic life or not. Um, now. So if, they, if they're not practicing Catholicism, how are they viewed? 
depends on why you're not practicing, honestly. Um, if you've just, to use our language, if you've backslidden and you've fallen out, um, you go to confession, you do your penance, you get back in good favor. Look at the language on, on uh, confession number four, confession or reconciliation. Those who approach the sacrament of confession obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him and are at the same time reconciled with the church which they have wounded by their sins and which by charity, by example, and by prayer labors for their conversion. So salvation and conversion are continual processes in the Catholic mind. There is none of this once saved, always saved, security of the believer, eternal security, whatever like that. Because again, it's about being in the church. It's not, it's not, you know, Protestants are the ones who came up with, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Catholics would have said, do you have a relationship with Jesus that puts you in the church? If you're in the church, then by default, you're in with Jesus. So, now, if you're, you've done something really heinous against the church, they might excommunicate you, you don't get back in. If you get excommunicated, you don't get back in. That, pretty much the bar for that is 100% blasphemy against God, Jesus, and the church. Um, I can give you an example. There is a, a um, independent Catholic church, Polish independent Catholic church in St. Louis, Missouri. The entire church, the priest, all the people in it have been excommunicated and have been since like the 60s or the 70s uh, because they, there were some, I don't remember the whole story now, but there were some issues with uh, how that church responded to Vatican II and what they did and did not do and then they started sort of denying that the Pope was the actual Pope. Um, <laughs> and so that's one thing you can't do is deny the Pope. Um, that, that'll get you out quick uh, because he is, the vicar of Christ. Right. Uh, so, you know, it just depends if you're reconcilable or not. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. If you're reconcilable or not, as to how you're viewed. Um, Catholics have had a very difficult time in history with what to do with the person who repents on their deathbed because if they have not been practicing Catholic, they have, as you see, number five on the sheet, anointing of the sick, extreme unction, last rites, all means the same thing. But the question is, is it enough to, at the point of death, go, you know, I probably should get this right. And because again, you still got the purgatory issue and, and whatever like that. Uh, so, There, there's some gray area. There, there's some question marks. Different Catholics will answer that in different ways. Um, I, the, the most common response now is you express faith, you express desire, you returned, you just didn't have enough life left in you to participate. So yeah, you're probably still gonna go to purgatory, but we will pray for you. Purgatory is kind of like institution. Yeah. That's that's a good. That's good. You do not always stay there. You can be prayed out of purgatory. Purgatory. Look at the word. Uh, what color do I? Want? Let's use red. That seems fitting. Uh, purgatory has as its root purge. The word purge. It's all about cleansing. You died with unrepented sin. You died for sin for which you did not do penance, which is a different thing than repenting. So you go to purgatory to quite literally have the sin burned out of you. You go to purgatory to have the sin burned out of you, cleansed out of you. This is, uh, I really hope no one takes this the wrong way, but the impulse behind it is they're going to burn the hell out of you. Now, you can go to purgatory, and if you're not well supported by prayers and whatever like that, you can go to hell. 
but you don't stay in purgatory. You go one way or the other. That is the place of cleansing. That is like the ultimate penance is to go to purgatory. Now, I, I must tell you, since we're on purgatory, and I have done one page of my notes tonight, and that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, there are people of many faiths, many denominations who believe in purgatory. I know Baptists who believe in purgatory. Um, the general perspective on purgatory among Catholics, Anglicans, whoever else believes in purgatory, uh, this is twice in one Sunday, I, I, this is great. C.S. Lewis, and I'm doing it without misspeaking, uh, believed in purgatory because he said, would you not want to be cleaned up before you go before the king of kings? Do you really want to show up in your filthy rags or would you rather be cleaned up? So you have to be made pure in order to be in the presence of God. Now, okay, let's flip that on its head. Presbyterians, Baptists, the rest of us say, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I don't need to be purged because God's not looking at me in my sinfulness. He's looking at me as clothed with Jesus. So you've got, you've got tension. Where does purgatory come from? One place it comes from, the rich man in Abraham's bosom. Or the rich man in Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. What is Abraham's bosom? The Jews view it as a waiting place for paradise. Um, but it has been interpreted as purgatory. That's one example. Um, so, you know, don't, don't take all of this and think they're just making this stuff up. It is an interpretive decision. can't do anything for it because he's in purgatory he's not righteous himself so his prayer wouldn't do anything yeah, for this man right right but I see your point I don't know They use more of it than we do. But <laughs> they use it differently. I mean, okay. Uh, if, you, if you go to a Catholic Mass, you are going to hear an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, an epistle, and a gospel. All before you get to the homily. And sometimes you get a psalm thrown in for fun. It's not really for fun. There are appointed days when you do the psalms. But... Uh, so you hear far more Bible. Now, when I say Old Testament lesson, it may be apocrypha, because for them, the Old Testament apocrypha is scripture. But you're going to get Old Testament, New Testament, epistle, gospel, at least, every time you go in. Um, that is on a rotation. Every Catholic church in captivity does the same readings every Sunday. Yeah, uh, they, they use the... A kind of lectionary is what it's called. Uh, so it doesn't matter. You can go to Hattiesburg. You got you got your pick of Saint Rose, Saint Fabian, Saint Thomas Aquinas, and uh, Sacred Heart. You can go to any one of the four and hear the same reading, and basically go to the same service except the homily will be different, depending on the priest or the deacon who gives it. But the rest of it will be the same. Uh, 
I would lean more toward tradition. So they follow a church calendar, like a very regimented church calendar with feast days for saints. And, you know, we, like here, we've kind of recently started thinking about Advent. Um, of course, what I think most Protestants associate with Catholics, unfortunately, is Lent. Um, we're kind of the oddballs out because most everybody does Lent, but anyway, that's a different story. Um, but right right but but again this is not just a uniquely catholic thing i mean when i preached this past summer at the the presbyterian church in laurel first trinity presbyterian they use the revised common lectionary which is used by the the pc usa uh, a good bit of the united methodist church uh, the event Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. I mean, you've got, again, several groups using, it's not the same as the Catholic, but it is among them the same. So several years ago, I spoke at uh, the Methodist Church in Knox Park. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if it was maybe a week ago, maybe. What, what is the Carnage Chapel? And Congregational. Who? Which one? Turnage Chapel or Kokomo. Turnage Chapel. Kokomo has changed their name. Tur uh, Kokomo was Chapel UMC. Or, yeah. Okay. They were UMC. Turnage Chapel has always been congregational to my knowledge. Okay. So I, I, I spoke at Kokomo Methodist mm -hmm. uh, a year and a half ago or so. It was about three years ago I spoke to them on the subject. And they were Right. When I came back to church that evening. It's either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, but toward the end of it, it says, I believe in the one holy Catholic church. But they're using, yeah, they're using Catholic in the lowercase sense to mean universal, uh, not Roman Catholic. So um, that statement of faith, that the Apostles' Creed has been used for nearly 2,000 years among churches of all stripes. Um, it has sort of gotten maligned because it has Catholic in it. And some churches have changed it to say universal to avoid the confusion. Uh, so all of the Catholic churches in our neck of the woods, Col I know of one in Colorado, yeah. I don't know if there's another. Um, one in Columbia? Holy Trinity in Columbia. And then several in Hattiesburg. Four over there. Are they all Roman Catholic? Or? Mm -hmm. okay. you're, you're very, very hard pressed to find independent Catholic around here. I mean, they, you're very hard pressed to find them anywhere uh, because to be independent Catholic, you have to reject the entire power structure in Rome, which is the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops, the archbishops, uh, the whole nine yards in order to be independent Catholic. Um, now you can go into other parts of the world and there are a variety of Catholic churches that are not Roman Catholic, but their practice is also different. Um, there's a, I, I don't know why this shows up on my YouTube feed. All, I gotta finish. I don't know why this shows up on my YouTube feed all the time, but there is a, a church in, somewhere in California that claims to have the real Pope. And so it'll be like, this Sunday's homily by Pope, whatever his name is, I don't know. I never watch it, but it's just, I have limits. <laughs> but, but, yeah, he's at St. Fabian. Yeah, which is on 589. Going toward yeah, Purvis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's still. So, my last question. Yeah. Because this is another one. Okay. So, the, the, the division, whether that's perceived or whatever yeah. it is between us and them, you mentioned how um, it's kind of our viewpoint, like we view that as everybody's mm -hmm. kind of, like it's the enemy to everybody else. Right. But like Most, 
okay, really old school Catholics, and there are really old school Catholics, and talking about there, there are these people out here who call themselves, I didn't ask for all this, but uh, set of Vaticanists. It's a really long title. They reject everything about Vatican II. They want Latin mass, they want nuns and habits, they want all the stuff that existed before 1962 back. If you ask one of them, we are going to hell in a handbasket because we have rejected the one true church. If you ask most Catholics now, they view us as something like wayward brethren. Um, they, they, will, they do not doubt our belief because we hold the same belief about the person and work of Jesus and the Trinity and all of that. They do not doubt our belief. They doubt our practice because we don't have the same view as them on the Eucharist, on repentance, on the priesthood. Uh, for Catholics, you know, because the, the priest acts in persona Christi in the, in the person of Christ, um, you have to go through the priest in order to receive forgiveness. Hence, confession. Okay, we're not about that. We might walk down there and talk to Kevin about it, but Kevin can't do nothing for us. Um, so for them, we miss that sacrament. We miss the Eucharist because we don't have the right view of it. Um, basically, all we have going for us is we have good intentions. And that's good enough to get us in smoking. But we're not in full communion. Total Christians, I guess. But even a lot of that is kind of gone Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I love Father Tommy. He's, mm -hmm. I've known him my whole life because one of my best friends is Catholic, and he was at um, St. Peter's in Bassfield. And uh, so, and he still, I don't, well, I don't know if he would now. I haven't seen him in years, but the last time I saw him, he knew who I was. Um, and he is, I, I've said it in here before, Father Tommy has an absolute pastor's heart. He takes mm -hmm. care of his people. Um, and, and, you know, there again, it's not just, Culture has done a lot of damage to our perception of the Catholic Church because things like the, the, the child sex abuse stuff, you know, it's an issue. It is an issue, but it's not every Catholic priest everywhere. You know, uh, Baptists are just as guilty. We, it just hadn't been uncovered yet in a lot of cases. Um, so it just concentrated power corrupts. Anyway, uh, lest I get political, I'll stop. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, well, okay, so we will pick up with the rest of this next week. Yeah, page two, that's good. Or we can just do a Q&A. I like this. I'd rather it be that way. I'd rather it be that way. So, uh, it was Father Mark, but I don't know if he's still there or not. Oh, well, it's not him anymore.